Hello, good morning. Okay, so um, I just uh, a while ago released the leaderboard ranking. Okay, so I hope you have seen it. Okay, um, yeah, so if you have um, anything that you want to clarify, you can uh, contact the TA that did the assessment all right, for that particular challenge. All right, and uh, uh, if you need to clarify anything about the final score. Okay. Yeah, so I know some of you will be very happy, some of you may be uh, disappointed, okay, but uh, okay, uh, what I would like to say is do not uh, let this ranking uh, determine your final grade, okay. Uh, in the past, we've always had uh, many cases where groups have done very well in the leaderboard, okay, but in the end, uh, the final grade is still not as expected because the exam is not done so well, okay. So. Um, so it can go either way, okay. Just because you did well in the in this challenge and the leaderboard, you are ranked highly, does not guarantee you a good grade, okay. And it's also the other way around, okay. Just because you are ranked lowly, okay, in the leaderboard, doesn't mean you cannot get a good grade in the end, okay. So this is only uh, a part of your overall project marks, right? Uh, you still have your other components, okay, which you need to work on and submit. Okay, uh, so later I'll also send an announcement on the uh, claims, okay, for the project claims uh, for you to, to uh, reimburse whatever you have spent, okay, uh, cap at $40 per kit. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started, okay, for today's uh, final topic, okay, on the uh, virtual memory, okay, and then uh, towards the end, I'll also talk about the uh, uh, exam, okay, and things to note. Okay, so we are at the uh, final uh, topic here, virtual memory and DMA. Okay, so for this topic, uh, is, uh, I mean, there are quite a few slides, but the concept is fairly, I think, manageable, all right? Uh, so I won't have a break, I'll just carry on until we finish everything, and then we'll talk about the exam, okay? Okay, so in, in last, uh, Week's lecture, we talked about the memory in, in terms of uh, while the code is compiled and executed and how you manage the memory requirements as your program is running. Okay, here we are going to talk about it at uh, one level higher, okay, uh, in terms of how we manage the overall uh, memory requirements of your system with the limited uh, actual memory that you may have. Okay, how do we do this? Okay, so these are just some. Uh, historical pictures to show you how far we have come, okay, from the time that the concept of a computer system and memory was invented and so on. Okay, so this is just for your own reading, okay. Uh, of course, now we are much, much uh, further ahead already in terms of technology. Okay, so in terms of growth, uh, the capacity is increasing uh, tremendously, okay, at a very high rate. Okay, so around four times capacity uh, every three years. Okay, that means the when we talk about capacity means this the amount of memory I can uh, squeeze into a into the same footprint. Okay, so when we say footprint means the amount of space you occupy. All right, and why that is important because that allows us to pack more stuff into a smaller space, so you can make your products more compact. Okay, uh, and that is where the growth of all these uh, wearables and all have taken flight. All right, because we have been able to squeeze. Uh, a lot more from a very little space, okay? So the other issue is capacity is one thing, right? but the other thing that should also go hand in hand with the bandwidth, which is how fast I can access my data, all right? So having a lot of data storage is good, but how fast can I access this data is also important, right? That also determines how effectively uh, you can run your system, okay? So that is where there is this gap. Okay, where your DRAM capacity okay, is growing uh, at a much higher rate than the bandwidth growth. Okay, so there's always this uh, performance gap. Okay, there's always this performance gap where the uh, CPU performance, all right, as you can see, is always going to outperform the memory. All right, so you may have a very, very fast processor, okay, that can execute at, at, at extremely high rates. Okay, by the end of the day, you are still going to be slowed down because of your memory. Okay, and you need the memory. Okay, so uh, no matter how fast you run, you still have to wait for the memory to catch up. 
Okay, so that has always been an issue. All right, so uh, because of that big issue, uh, that is also a very uh, actively looked at uh, research area. All right, that means how do we fill this gap? Okay, so of course, ideally, uh, the memory itself, if it can uh, naturally perform at that same speed as the CPU, that would be the best. All right, but that is uh, involves many uh, physics involved, all right, because the I mean, physics physics-based uh, concepts because of the semiconductor, the technology of manufacturing, uh, and so on. So in terms of the uh, sort of science behind manufacturing all these kind of uh, components, how small we can go, so that is another challenging domain to explore. Right? But on the uh, uh, sort of software side and the hardware side, uh, what can developers do okay, or what can architects do? So that is what we're going to be looking at. Okay, so in terms of the SRAM and uh, DRAM, okay, so this is just to give you an idea. Okay, if you look at the structure of the cell, so one cell is basically to store to, to store uh, a single bit value. Okay, uh, so in a, a single SRAM cell, okay, uh, it consists of six transistors. Okay, so I'm sure you all know what is transistor. Okay, so a transistor basically occupies quite a bit of footprint. Okay, which means that uh, a single SRAM cell. Uh, takes up quite a bit of space, which means the density is low. Okay, the density is low, but because of the way it is structured, it is very fast. Okay, so it is very fast, but it is, uh, the density is low. That means I can only uh, pack a limited amount of SRAM cells into that particular area. Okay, whereas DRAM cells, okay, the structure is very, very simple. It's just one transistor and one capacitor. Okay, so the structure is very simple, which means that the density is very high. I can pack a lot of DRAM cells okay, into the same footprint as compared to an SRAM uh, cells. Okay, but the access time is a lot slower. Okay, so as you can see, from 0.5 to 5 nanoseconds is more than 10 times, okay, 50 to uh, 70 nanoseconds. Okay, then you also have your main storage, correct? Your hard disk drive, or in our case, probably in the SSD and so on. So even though SSD is still very fast, okay, it is still considered a lot slower than your main memory that you are using in terms of your SRAM and DRAM. Okay, so if you compare uh, the sort of hierarchy and where we are, all right, we then generally what we want is we want a lot of memory at extremely high rates of uh, data transfer, but we also want it to be cheap. Okay, that will of course be the ideal situation. Okay, but that is not something we have right now. Okay, I mean, things may change, correct? I mean, five years later, 10 years later, there is a research breakthrough and suddenly, you know, we can get this, then uh, things may change. Okay, but uh, for now, we do not have something like this. All right, so what we have is we have different types of memory systems, okay, with different pros and cons. Okay, and then we need to try and sort of gel them together to develop our platform. Okay, so we want a big and fast memory, all right, but uh, we don't have the best of both worlds at the moment, all right? So different subsystems have different uh, uh, value add. So we are going to think of how we can put them together. So the, the idea is what, what is fast, okay? We want it near the CPU, all right? But we know fast is expensive, so we can only have a small amount. Okay, similarly, we also want a lot of storage, but the large storage is slower, so we keep it further away from the CPU. Okay, so we try to match these two things together, okay, through a hierarchy. Okay, so that is the sort of memory hierarchy, okay, where the storage that has the uh, largest size has a slower speed, okay, and as you go closer to the CPU, okay, your speed is the highest. Okay, so registers, of course, are the highest because registers are internal to the CPU, all right? That means the moment you want to access anything, they are immediately there, okay? Just like how you do assembly language programming. Okay, immediately, you can have access to any of the internal registers. Okay, so uh, what is the basic idea of, uh, that we are trying to implement, okay? By saying that we want to keep small uh, amounts of data in faster memory, okay? But how does this actually help us, all right? because of this concept called the principle of locality. Okay, what is this principle of locality is that program uh, generally accesses only a 
small portion of memory address space within a small time interval. Okay, so if you look at our code, okay, or generally most codes that you write, okay, or you observe, there is always uh, some loops involved. Okay, which means I run a few lines of code and then I will most likely repeat. Okay, and then after one, maybe I jump to somewhere else and so on. All right, and similarly, uh, while I'm in a loop, I also have similar uh, data elements that I will access. So within this time frame, you can see that I may access a few common variables. Okay, and then the next time, maybe another set of variables. Maybe this is an array and so on. Okay, and it sort of uh, is. You can generalize that this is the uh, behavior uh, most of the time, okay? And because of this, we can observe that there are two types of locality. One is called temporal and the other is spatial. So in terms of temporal means time, but that means if I have access a particular variable at this time, there's a high chance that within that same window, I will need to access it again, okay? And similarly, spatial locality. Okay, so in terms of spatial locality, if a memory has been uh, a memory element has been accessed, there's a high chance that uh, other memory elements nearby would also be accessed. All right, so because of this locality, all right, we can actually capitalize on this to improve the efficiency of the system. All right, so that is what we call the working set. That means when I look at a particular time window. Okay, there is this concept of locality, all right, where similar lines of code executed and similar data elements are also accessed. Okay, so in terms of uh, how we can do this, all right, so one is of course visible to the programmer. That means the programmer explicitly writes code to, to make full use of this locality. But this is of course, uh, Quite challenging, correct? Because for a programmer to make use of this, then he needs a uh, low level understanding of the registers, how to map variables to registers, and how to tweak them, and so on. Okay. The other one is transparent to programmer, okay, where you allow the system to handle it. Okay. So either during compile time or during runtime, okay, it sort of uh, intelligently manages the uh, memory. Okay. So if you look at the whole memory system, what you have is you have the processor, okay, and you have your main program, which is your hard disk. Okay, so in order for you to run your program, you need to transfer your data, okay, and your code, everything from your hard disk to your DRAM. And from the DRAM, you actually have a subset into the abstract, okay, and that is what you call the cache. So cache is very similar to the idea of, uh, virtual memory, okay, the concept is very similar. The only difference is uh, cache is what you call hardware managed. Okay, that means the hardware within the processor will manage the cache. That means decide how much of the DRAM I will keep in the SRAM, okay, to make it easier and faster for the processor to access. Whereas the virtual memory is managed by the OS, okay, where it has a small amount of DRAM, but yet it can manage the total amount of uh, memory that is actually needed by the process that is stored in the hard disk. Okay, so this is again transparent. So both of these are transparent to the programmer. Okay, if I use cache, the hardware handles it. If I use uh, virtual memory, the OS handles it. Okay, so the idea is the same, okay, but we are going to be focused on the virtual memory in this lecture. But the idea of the cache is similar, okay, very, very similar. Okay, so this is just another hierarchy summary. I'll not go through that. Okay, so this is just another uh, example to sort of show you uh, what is happening. Right? That means if you look at it in terms of the storage space, okay, this is a hard disk space. So you have a lot of space, okay, but you have a lot of access time. I mean, I mean, your time to access the data is very high. Okay, and as you bring it closer and closer and closer, okay, you can see that. I can access more data within the same cycle. All right, and there is also concept of miss penalty. Okay, this is why we will come to that later. Okay, so miss penalty is basically if I try to access the data and it's not there, 
then how much of a penalty will I incur to get the correct data? Okay, so this penalty will come to that later. All right, so basically the whole idea is we want to make the hard disk look like memory. Okay, that means we want to uh, use the DRAM effectively so that as much as possible, we access the data from the DRAM and minimize access to the hard disk. Okay, why? Because hard disk access is very, very slow. Okay, you want to minimize that and keep as much as possible within the DRAM space. Okay, so let's look at how it is going to be done. Okay, so the first concept is the process. All right? So when you say that you have a process that is running, we already understand that it's the instance of a running program, correct? Just like if you open up your browser, all right? So that is the instance of your browser. You can open up multiple browsers, all right? And each of it is own instance, okay? And when you open up a process, the idea is that process has seems to have exclusive access to the CPU, all right? So we already seen this in, in our code and, and when you are doing your project and so on, okay? And the idea of multitasking comes along because of the scheduler. So the scheduler manages all these contact switching that happens, okay, indefinitely throughout, okay, the life of the program. So this uh, memory layout okay, within the process is what you already see. Okay, so when I launch a process, okay, that process has code, has data, has global variables, we use the stack, we use the heap and so on. So Every time I launch a process, I need to set aside a certain amount of memory for that process to run effectively. Okay, so that is something we know. Now, what is virtual memory? Okay, so in terms of virtual memory, the program itself, okay, can, act, can refer to the entire memory space. Okay, so your processor may have a very large memory space, okay, to accommodate the, a very big hard disk, okay, but at the end of the day, you only have a limited amount of actual DRAM that is available for your process to use. Okay, so how, how does the virtual memory concept help us? Okay, so what you want to do is you want to be able to squeeze, okay, the entire hard disk space, okay, into a very small DRAM space. So this is a hard disk space and you want to squeeze everything into a, a DRAM space. Now, how can we do that? Okay, because your hard disk has so much of information, and every time you launch a process, you need to set aside some space, okay, inside your DRAM to accommodate the process for, to run effectively. Okay, so every time I launch a process, okay, I need all of this, right? I need to set aside memory for stack, for heap, for the text segment, the data segment, the DSS, everything. And I launch another process, again, I need to set aside another memory, correct? So I have to multiply n times, but it depends on how many processors I'm going to launch. So I need to make sure that I'm able to uh, allocate the required memory correctly within the uh, DRAM space that I have. Okay, so how do I do this? Okay, and at the same time, I also need to make sure that there is some form of protection. That means if two processors uh, that are running, they should not uh, rightfully be allowed to access the same memory if it is supposed to be only for one of the processors. All right, if this is for process I, then J should not access this memory page over here. But at the same time, you also want to share. All right, so there could be common uh, library code, okay, uh, or API calls where multiple processors may need to use. Okay, which you may want to put in a shared page. Okay, that multiple processors can access. Okay, so how can we go about uh, doing all of this? Okay, so we want to solve all of these using the virtual memory, using virtual memory. So let's look at how we can do it. Okay, and the basic idea is this concept of what we call indirection. So indirection basically means that instead of directly allowing myself to point to a memory address, I point to an intermediary block that tells me where I'm supposed to go to. The concept is similar to pointer, right? So in pointer, what do we do? We create an intermediary that allows the pointer to point to any new memory address. So I do not point to a fixed address, but I can be assigned the address I'm pointing to. 
Okay, so it is the same point of concept. Okay, so with that point of concept, what we are doing is we are allowing multiple processes to map to a limited amount of physical memory. Okay, so that is where the mapping comes in. Okay, so to do this mapping, basically what you need to do is you need to set aside or you need to know how much virtual address space you have. All right, where n to the power n is the uh, number of virtual addresses and the total number of bits for the physical address. So that is to the power of n. Okay, where n is greater than n because the virtual address space is always more than the physical address space. Okay, so the virtual address space is all the, the, the memory that you can actually access. Okay, but the physical address space is limited by the physical memory that you have. Okay, how much actual memory you have. Okay, and you want to map this entire virtual space to this limited memory space. Okay, so how are we going to do the mapping? So in a simple system that does not have virtual memory, okay? So for example, a very simple embedded microcontroller. Okay, what happens is, when you put out a physical address, okay, that physical address will point to one particular fixed location in the main memory. And then you'll be able to access that data, okay, and then retrieve it. Okay, so if I say load word, okay, from address uh, four, okay, okay, into maybe one of my registers, okay, uh, S0 or something. All right, so what will happen is the word from address location four will get loaded into register S0. Okay, so that is the idea. Okay, that means when I execute a command to say, I want to talk to address four and I want to read this word from that address, this is what will happen. But in the uh, concept of virtual addressing, what happens is your CPU will provide a virtual address, okay, to the MMU, which will then translate it into the physical address. So this MMU is your memory management unit. Okay, man memory management unit which will do a translation for us. So the key thing is, you do not need to know the actual address. Okay, you don't need an actual address. The actual address will be mapped through the uh, virtual address, okay, through the MMU over here. So what we need to, uh, or what it does for us is it abstracts the physical address for us. Okay, and we just focus on the virtual address space that is assigned to the process. So this abstraction makes it easy because at any point of time, the process address may change. Okay, one time I launch a process, I might go to one address. The next time I launch another process, I'll go to another address. Okay, and each time I may go to a new address because it depends on where I'm allocated by the OS. Okay, so the idea is when I launch a process, okay, you can imagine that the virtual memory has all of these pages, okay, in the hard disk, okay? So in the virtual memory, you have all of these pages, all right? And what we are going to do is we're going to break out this virtual memory into blocks, okay? And these blocks are what you call pages, okay? And the size of the page also is predetermined by how we design the virtual memory, okay? And what we do is this DRAM, Okay, is used as a temporary storage. Okay, so here we use the, the term cache. Okay, because like I said, the concept of cache and VM is exactly the same. Okay, it's exactly the same idea. So here we use the DRAM as a cache, which is a temporary storage for some of the pages. Okay, so as you can see, the physical memory that I have is always smaller than the virtual memory. So I can only keep a small subset of my virtual memory onto my physical memory. Okay, so when I look at my virtual memory page, okay, what I need to know is whether the page, okay, is currently unallocated. That means it is not being used. It is uncached, okay. That means it is used but is not in the DRAM or is cached, okay. It is used and is in the DRAM, okay. So we will look at these examples in a while. All right, so this again gives you the idea that, you know, of how the virtual address space maps to the physical address space. 
Okay, and it doesn't have to be contiguous. Okay, as you can see, it doesn't have to be that the virtual address uh, and physical address must go in sequence. Okay, you can be randomly assigned to any page, okay, depending on what is available at that time. Okay. So virtual address, okay, can map to either the physical memory or to the hard disk. Okay, so let's look at some example. Okay, then we understand what is going to happen. All right, so the first thing is we need to know how many, uh, how big is the virtual address space and the physical address space. <clears throat> so for the virtual address space, we are given 16 kilobytes, okay, which means it is 14 bit virtual address. For 4 kilobyte, it is uh, physical address, it is 12 bit. Okay, so this one you can just use your calculator to check, okay, how many bits, okay. Uh, for each of the, uh, how many bits for the size, okay? So, when I have 16 kilobytes, all right, I have 14 bits, and I have 4 kilobytes, I have 12 bits. So, what am I uh, having here? So, I have a total of uh, 16 kilobytes of virtual memory, and I'm going to map it to uh, physical uh, memory of uh, 4 kilobytes. Okay, and I set aside a page size of 64 bytes. Okay, so this page size is consistent across both the virtual memory and physical memory. Okay, that means the number of uh, pages that I will have, okay, is equals to total size is 16 kilobytes, okay, and divided by one page is 64 bytes, which will give me 256. That means I have a total of 256 pages here. Okay, zero to 255. And I do the same thing over here. So physical memory, each page is 64 bytes. Okay, that means over here, I have 4 kilobytes over 64, which will give me 64 pages. That means 0 to 63. Okay. Now, once I do that, the next thing is to look at it in the bits. Okay, how to do the mapping of the bits. Now, since I know that each page size is 64 bytes, okay, what I need to do is, I first set aside the, uh, okay, so here what they have done is, they look at how many pages do I have. So here, this is what we just did. We said that you have 256 pages over here for the virtual memory and 64 pages for the physical memory. Now the next thing is, since I have 256 pages for the virtual memory, how many bits do I need? I need eight bits. And similarly, if I have 64 pages for my physical memory, I need six bits. All right, now, how does that work out? That means total for virtual address space, I need 14 bits, all right? So I need total of 14 bits. Okay, so this is the virtual memory, and this is the physical memory, and this I need 12 bits. So this is 14, and this is 12. Okay, so how do I set aside the 8 and the 6? Okay, so that is over here. Alright, so the one, one thing you'll notice here is the page offset is the same. This page offset is depending on the page size. So we know that 2 to the power of 6 is 64, okay? So within the page, okay, that means for one virtual memory page, okay, let's say this is the virtual memory page. And I happen to map it to somewhere in my physical memory. Okay, so this is one page in virtual memory mapped to another page in physical memory. Okay, so that page is the same size. Okay, that means if this is 64 bytes, here is also 64 bytes. So this page offset is to do what? That means within the 64 bytes, which byte am I referring to? Okay, which byte am I referring to? So that is why you need six bits. Okay, because I got 64 bytes, I need to specify which byte I'm referring to within that page. Okay, but that is the, okay, so that is the within the page itself. But to know exactly what is this page number, 
what is this page number and what is this page number okay so that is where i have the virtual page number and the physical page number and how many virtual pages do i have okay so i have 256 virtual pages and 64 physical pages which means i have the eight bits over here okay and the six bits over here Okay, so the eight bits over there is to specify out of the uh, 256 pages, which page am I referring to? And the six pages is out of 64 pages, which page am I referring to for the physical memory? Okay, so the page offset is fixed. Is the, it's not fixed, it's the same for both the virtual memory and physical memory. Then the remaining bits is actually mapping of the virtual page number to the physical page number. Okay, so in terms of the address translation, okay, you can see that a page table entry, okay, basically contains this information. That means it contains the information of where I map to. Okay, so if I map, okay, to the DRAM, okay, then I can directly take the data from the DRAM. Okay, but if I do not map it to the DRAM, okay, that means it is still in the hard disk. If it is still in the hard disk, then I need to do a swap later on, okay, which we will cover. All right, so every page table is for one process, okay? So when you launch a process, you have a page table associated with that. And the page table are also stored in the DRAM, okay? So if you look at this page table, okay, you will notice that besides the mapping of the virtual address to the physical address, you also have another bit here called the valid bit. Called the valid bit. Okay, so this valid bit, okay, is to imply the status, whether it is cache or uncache. Okay, when we say it is cache, that means that data is already in the DRAM. Is uncache means it is not yet in the DRAM. I need to move it to the DRAM. All right, so if I look at this example, okay, you made the same example, 256 pages. Okay, so if I want to access, for example, this uh, entry in the page table, it maps to a physical page number and the valid bit is set, which means what? That means that the mapping to this particular physical page is already in the DRAM. So I can directly take from the DRAM. But if I want to map to this location, Okay, it says disk and it's uncached, which means that this is not yet in the DRAM, it is still in the hard disk. Okay, so I cannot access it from the DRAM, I still need to go to the hard disk to get it. Okay, so if you come back to this, the total page table size, okay, how big is the page table size? The page table size is to contain the mapping of the valid bit together with the physical page number bits. Okay, so in each page table entry, you have one valid bit and six physical page number bits. Okay, so let me come here. So what does that mean? That means over here, okay, you imagine that the uh, same example, that means we have zero all the way to 255. Okay, zero all the way to 255. In each page table entry, I need to set aside one bit to say whether it's valid or not. Okay, that means it's cash or uncash. Then what is inside this information? What is inside this information is the actual physical page number. Is it page number zero, page number one, all the way to page number 63 in our example. Okay, because 64 physical pages and 256 virtual pages. Okay, so what is inside the page table is actually the page number. Okay, which page number am I mapping to? Okay, so that is why it's here. The one valid bit, okay, to say whether it's cache or uncached, plus the six bits to specify which physical page number I'm mapping to. All right, so that is what you have here. So how does the whole thing work? Okay, what will happen is when your processor puts out a virtual address, okay, that virtual address would already be split into two parts. 
Okay, one is the page offset and the other is the page number. So this of course depends on how many bits we have set aside. So in our example, we know that this is six bits and this is eight bits. Okay, the six bits for the page offset is the same six bits, okay, for both the physical and the virtual. So the same six bits will come here. And this virtual address, this points to an entry in the table. Okay, and in our case, we have 256, so 0 to 255. Okay, and when I point to a entry in the table, I will first check whether it's valid. Okay, if it is valid, that means this information is correct. That means I have the correct mapping to uh, entry in the physical uh, memory. Okay, so I will take this information and copy it over here. Okay, so that is the physical page number. So that will give me the physical page number, which I can then combine with my physical page offset to know the final address that I'm supposed to access. Okay, the final address that I'm supposed to access in the DRAM. Okay, so that is how the whole thing works. So every time I put out a virtual address, the page offset, virtual page offset will be mapped to the physical page offset. The virtual page number will point to an entry in the page table. Okay, if the page table value bit is set, then I know I have the correct data in the page table. So I take that entry and pad it together with the physical page offset to get my final physical address. So this will point to my DRAM. And I'll be able to extract out the data. Okay, so in uh in a situation where the data is correctly in the DRAM, then we say it is a hit. Okay, so when my virtual address points to this location, okay, you can see that it is pointing to this particular entry in the page table. So the valid bit is set. So it maps to an entry over here in the physical memory. So we say it is a hit. Okay. What if I point to an entry which does not have a copy in the physical memory? So in this case, the valid bit is zero. So it is not yet mapped to the physical memory. It is still mapped to somewhere in the hard disk. Okay, so this is what we call a page fault. Okay, this is what we call a page fault. So what happens in a page fault? Okay, so when a page fault occurs, all right, the exception is raised. Okay, so the, what the OS will do is it will load the page from the disk to the virtual memory, uh, to the physical memory, and modify the page table entry. Okay, and then it will return to the same instruction that caused the issue and retry it. Okay, so in our case over here, when I have a page fault over here, what will happen is is trying to access this entry in the page table, but it is not yet mapped, okay, to the DRAM. So what must I do? I must first select a victim, okay, from the physical DRAM. Okay, this is of course, in this case where it is full. Okay, that means there's no more space. I select one of the slots to be uh, overwritten. Okay, so in this case, virtual page four will get overwritten. Okay, that means the physical page three. Okay, so physical page three here will get overwritten. And what I will do is I will take the content of the uh, virtual page three that I wanted to access and I put it over here into physical page three. Okay, and then once I do that, okay, I restart the same instruction and I get a page hit. Okay, so this is what just now I mentioned the penalty. All right, that means I try to access it, okay, but it's not in the DRAM. So I incur a penalty, which is to go to the hard disk, take the correct data, put it into the DRAM, and then restart the instruction. Okay, so that is where the page hit comes in. Okay, so that is what happens for a page hit and a page fault. Okay, and then coming back to this, why do we say it works? 
Okay, why do we say it works? Because your concept of locality. That means in terms of spatial and temporal locality, there's a high chance that you will access data that is nearby, you will access the code that is nearby. All right, so once uh, the initial misses are there, the page fault occur and you already copy the data in, there's a high chance you will have a lot of hits after that, okay, before the next uh, page fault occurs. All right, so again, this is generally speaking, all right, uh, based on how most of the code is written. Okay, so that's why it works. Okay, so these are just some examples of how to manage multiple processes. So in this example, you can see that, for example, physical page six here is shared by both processes, process one and process two. Okay, and this could be because it is a read-only library code. That means it's a read-only code, so it is fine to share it. Okay, whereas the other virtual pages of the different processes map to different physical pages. Okay, so the whole idea of virtual memory is it gives us this advantage where you don't need to worry about the sequence at all because the virtual memory abstracts it through the table. Okay, so that is for the protection uh, for the sharing. In terms of protection, they also have this thing called uh, in the MMU, we have this thing called permission bits. So what are permission bits? Permission bits are basically uh, bits where you can specify the uh, sort of uh, rights or restrictions for different pages. Okay, so for example, you can specify that certain pages you can write, certain pages you cannot write, they only read and only and so on. Okay, so that will allow, okay, uh, a level of protection where if a process tries to write to a page, okay, that is marked as read only, then it will show up as a segmentation form. Okay, and then you have to debug. Okay, so these are some of the inbuilt protection mechanisms that the OS handles for us. Okay, so let's look at this again, the page hit. Okay, so if you look at this whole sequence, what happens? All right, so the very first time I put out a virtual address, okay, to the MMU, what will the MMU do? Okay, it first needs to access the page table. Okay, but what is the issue here? The page table is also inside the memory. Okay, so it first needs to send the page table entry and uh, address over to the page table and then get back the page table entry. Okay, and then only you can access the page. Okay, so there's actually two access. This is the first access. Okay, the first access and this is the second access. Okay, why two access? Because the page table that we want to access is also in the DRAM. So I need to access it one time to check whether the correct mapping is there. And after that, I get back and I go again the second round to get the actual data. Okay, and once I point to the correct physical memory, I can get the data out. Okay, so you can see that there is practically three access. First for the DRAM, second to send out the actual uh, physical address, and the third one is where I actually read the data. Okay. If it is a fault, it's even worse. That means it's not there, correct? So what happens? If I try to access, okay, and then you don't, when you, get, when you get back to the page table entry, they say that the valid bit is zero, correct? That means it is not cached. Then what happens? Then I raise the exception. Then the OS port handler will come in and do like what we said just now. It needs to evict a page, put in a new page, and then start this whole thing again. Okay, so you can see that the process can be quite tedious, all right, especially for a page four. Okay, and there's a lot of memory access involved. Okay, so how can I improve it? Okay, as you can see, the, the whole process sounds very slow. Okay, because I need to access the table first and then go back in to access the memory. So how can I make this faster than what it already is? Okay, so one of the things is to put aside what we call a translation look aside buffer. There is another cache. Okay, another cache. That means from the uh, table in the DRAM, okay, I keep a subset inside my MMU. 
inside the MM view. So what happens is this is the full page table in the DRAM where I map all the virtual address addresses over here to the physical addresses. Okay, but this whole thing is in DRAM. That means every time I want to check, I have to go to the DRAM. So what I can do is I can take a subset of it and put it inside my on-chip translation, translation look aside buffer. So when I do this, what happens? Every time I want to check, I check inside here first. Okay, and after I don't have it here, then only I go to the DRAM. Okay, so it sort of adds another layer of what you call caching. All right, that means I keep another subset within the MMU. And the MMU is part of the processor, which means I don't need to go out to the DRAM. Okay, so this is what you have. Okay, so you can see that the, the whole idea is you want to minimize as much as possible the memory access because the memory access is always the slowest link. Okay, so we try to minimize it as much as possible. So I take a subset, put within the processor, okay, so it's within the processor chip. So everything is very fast. Only when I don't have it inside, then I go outside to the cache. Okay, and then I take the data in. Okay, so in terms of uh, translation, okay, with the page table, Okay, so if I have a normal physical page table, what will happen is I will go to the page table entry and I do like this now. That means the page offset on the virtual memory map to the same page offset. And with the page num number points to one of the entries in the page table and I take that and I join it together with my physical page number. Okay, that will give me the physical address to access. Okay, with a TLB hit, Okay, a TLB is, is a subset of the actual memory, uh, actual table in the memory. So what I do is, if the TLB already has a hit, then I can straight away access the data that I want from the content that I get within the TLB itself. Okay, so the access is much faster. But if it's a miss, that means the translation look aside buffer is a miss, then what happened? Okay, then I have to go through one round again. That means I need to take from the DRAM, put it into my TLB, okay, and then restart the instruction. Okay, so you can see that every time there is a miss, there is a penalty incurred. Okay, but because of the locality concept, all right, uh, the number of misses are much slow, uh, are much more fewer, correct, compared to that of the hits. So the overall performance improvement is still there. Okay, so you, you, this all puts everything together. Okay, so you can see that every time what happens is, okay, first I put out a virtual address. Okay, and what does the MMU do? It tries to see whether I can match with the TLB. I mean the, the subset of the table within the MMU itself. If it's a hit, I can straight away access. If it is a miss, then I go to the DRAM, okay, take the page table for the DRAM and update that with the TLB, okay, and then I try to restart. But the page table also might not have it, correct? Right? Because maybe it's still in the hard disk. So if there's a page fault, then I need to uh, initiate the segmentation fault, all right, which will then cause me to swap out one of the pages from the page table, okay, with the hard disk space and then restart the whole instruction again. Okay, so the process is there, okay? And you can, you can see that the further we go out, that means from the TLB, I go out to the page table. Of course, if it's a hit, it's good, it's very fast. But if it's a miss again, then the segmentation of all, I go out to the hard disk. Then I have to load back everything and then restart. Okay, so every time there is a miss, there is a penalty, okay? But again, the, the misses are much more fewer compared to the hits. Okay, so that really helps the system to perform much more efficiently than not having all of this. Okay, so that is why all this really helps the system to be a lot more efficient. Okay, so that sort of uh, puts up, uh, or sort of wraps up the, um, the whole virtual memory uh, topic. Okay, uh, so in the tutorial, there will be some questions, okay, later, uh, just to, to give you the idea of virtual memory and how it works. Okay, so just a simple example to put everything together. Okay, so the last part is another peripheral that I just wanted to add, okay, which uh, we, we didn't 
we will sort of introduce you to this idea before in uh, IDP2, okay, but we didn't go into the details, okay, but the, the, this thing is called what we call the DMA, the, the direct memory access. Uh, the KL25Z actually does have a DMA module, okay, so if you are keen to explore, you can try to write some code, you know, after the exams are over and then, uh, you know, try to see how to get it to work. So the DMA, uh, what does it do? It's a, it's a peripheral block that allows you to move data, okay, between uh, peripherals and CPU uh, without, uh, between the peripheral and the memory without getting the CPU involved, okay? And why is this important? Because if the CPU is not involved, okay, there is no overhead. All right, so what is the overhead, okay, with the CPU? Because whenever I want to move data around, I'm executing instructions, all right, okay? So if you imagine that if I have my memory over here, okay, so this is from address, I say A000, and this is address B000. And if I say move this byte to this byte, okay, technically what I need to do, I need to first load, okay, or load word or load byte or whatever to a register and then do a store word. So every time I, I need to move one chunk of data, there is always the processor involved. Because this is involving execution of instructions, or right? I wish the processor is doing something. Okay, but with a DMA, I can bypass this. Okay, so how does this work? So what happens is, as you can see, there is some there are some uh, switches here for the buses. Okay, so the two main buses are the address bus and the data bus. So what happens is, if your, uh, your processor or the controller has a DMA. Okay, there will be this DMA controller that also has the ability to access the bus. Okay, so it can sort of switch off the CPU access and take over the bus. So when you can take over the bus, what happens? It can allow memory access or can allow data, data transfer between memory and a peripheral. Okay, for example, you plug in your thumb drive, okay, and you want to move one gigabyte of data from a thumb drive to your hard disk. Okay, that whole thing can happen with a DMA without getting the processor involved. Okay, so basically what will happen is the peripheral, okay, or even your software, you can initiate a data transfer. Okay, when that happens, you send that request to the DMA controller. Okay, and the DMA controller will then request the CPU to uh, take over the bus. Okay, once the CPU acknowledges and allows the DMA, it will actually take the, uh, you relinquish the bus and let the DMA take over the bus, which will mean that the, that the data transfer is approved and then the data transfer will take place after that. Okay, of course, once everything is over, the DMA controller is responsible for handling, uh, handing the control back to the processor. Okay, so this sort of gives you the idea. That means the, the, the address and data bus, okay, which is, common across all of them, okay, can be switched on and off between the DMA and the CPU, okay, through the DMA request and DMA acknowledge, okay, between the processor and the DMA block. Okay, uh, there are two basic types of DMA transfer, what is what we call the burst mode and the other is what we call the cycle stealing mode. Okay, in terms of the cycle stealing mode, uh, okay, so in burst mode, what happens? In burst mode, what happens is you allow the DMA to fully uh, uh, control the CPU, uh, control the address and data bus. Okay, so when the DMA takes full control of the address and data bus, the CPU cannot make use of the bus. Okay, because the CPU needs the bus to fetch instructions and execute. All right, so when I go in burst mode, the bus is fully controlled by the DMA, so the CPU cannot have access to the bus. Okay, but in the cycle steel mode, what happens is you are interleaving uh, the DMA and the CPU. So this allows the data transfer to happen a bit more slowly. Okay, but you are sharing the bus with both the DMA and the CPU. So this allows some form of CPU activity to happen while the DMA transfer is also happening. Okay, so again, all of this depends on what kind of uh, setup or mechanism is supported by the controller that you're using, okay? But it's all transparent to the sort of programmer, okay? Uh, as long as we want to use it, we can set it up and then we can use it.
Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to cover for the DMA. All right, uh, like I said, the the details of it and all how to implement is a lot more. Okay, that is something you can explore on your own. Okay, with the KL two by Z. Okay, but uh, other than that, that's all sort of wraps up uh, this whole uh, chapter. Okay, as well as the module. Okay, so yeah, we are done. All right, we are done with the whole module. Okay, where we have covered uh, both uh, embedded systems and the RTOS and everything. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So I just want to also highlight the feedback that you all gave for the mid, so mid semester feedback form that I sent out. Okay. So uh, I mean generally I would say most of the feedback is good. Okay. Uh, I mean there are some students who wanted Artos to be starting earlier and some wanted more in depth hardware. So there's always I would say pockets of uh, interest in one or the other. Okay. In terms of whether we should have uh, more of uh, OS and things like that. Okay, but uh, I would say generally uh, this module has always been well received by everybody. Okay, uh, so I, I hope that you also enjoyed okay uh, learning this uh, module together with, with your friends and, and whatever we have covered here. Okay, so again, uh, just to shout out again, uh, we are not having two to seven one next semester. Uh, but the following semester we will have it and then again it will start again. All right. Uh, but if you are interested to apply for a TA, uh, whatever it is, whether it's uh, uh, this module or any other module, you need to make sure you apply it through the SOC online portal. Okay. And you need to do this every semester. It is not guaranteed. Uh, There's no auto renewal. Okay. So you are TA this semester, you still need to apply again for next semester and so on. Okay, so every semester you need to keep applying again to indicate your interest. Okay, and you need to also indicate the modules you are applying for. All right. Uh, so again, placement is not guaranteed. All right. Uh, again, depends on the module coordinator, whoever is handling it. Okay. So again, for EPP1, EPP2, they, they are always on the lookout. Okay, so for EPP1, uh, if you're interested, please uh, contact uh, Prof. Missing. Okay, you can email him and uh, tell him your interest. Okay, uh, for EPP2, you can email me or you can email Colin. All right, and then uh, we will take note of your interest. Okay, but again, always important to apply through the online portal. Okay, so that your, your sort of interest is captured there. Okay, so... Uh, some of the important things about the exam. All right, so it's a closed book. Okay, we provided reference sheet. So I already uploaded the reference sheet yesterday. Okay, uh, under exam folder. Okay, so that is the only uh, soft copy reference sheet that you can access uh, during the exam. Okay, uh, other than that, you're not allowed to have any other material. Okay, so the rest of it is the same. Okay, the Zoom proctoring, screen recording, uh, Google form uh, and the clarification, all of that form and all of that is, is the same, okay? So the topics covered will be, of course, from lecture nine onwards, which means the focus on autos onwards. We will not go back to the lower level hardware, okay? But uh, in terms of uh, the register configuration, all of that, all of that will not be tested, but the concepts of, uh, the basic concepts of those things must still be known. Okay, what do I mean by basic concept? That means, if in the question there is a mention of an interrupt, there's a mention of a serial interface. Okay, you should still know what is a serial interface. You should still know what is an interrupt. Okay, so, but of course, I will not be asking you how to configure this register, how to configure that the serial port to this particular behavior or things like that. Okay, so those low level uh, details, register configurations, and all of those stuff will not be tested. Okay, but those idea, I mean, the idea of uh, those things that we covered, GPIOs, UART, PWM. So the general idea you, you should still know. Okay, but not the low level details. Okay, so the focus will be on uh, OS onwards. Okay, it will be MCQ, true, false, plus structured questions. Okay, so there will be some parts of it where you are required to write some code. Okay, uh, so I will specify clearly what you need to write and so on. Okay, so you do not. Uh, so you just look at the question carefully and then you answer. Okay. Um, yeah, so past year papers, if you download, uh, again, there may be some differences in coverage uh, over the years. 
Okay, so if you come across some topic that uh, you have not seen at all in our course, then that means probably there's a change in the syllabus. Okay, but other than that, the concepts will still be the same. Okay, so that sort of uh, wraps up. Anything that you want to ask about the exam? Any questions? So I got a quick question regarding just now the memory access that one. Uh. Uh, yeah. So when you implement with the TLB, correct, and the external memory part there, uh, just on the, the next diagram. Ah, this one. So let's say you have a TLB miss and a page fault. So you mm. access the secondary storage. So after you fill the page table mm. with the necessary address, mm. then you say you restart again, correct? Yeah. So does it so mean you will... you will restart, you will go back to page table and from page table, you still need to update back the TLB. Oh, so wait, so basically, will it be another TLB miss again? Then this time the page table has what it wants. No, so what will happen is you will go all the way back first. So the so from the page fault, I mean from segmentation fault, correct. You will update, update the page table. Yes, correct. And you also update the TLB. Oh, okay. So I'll restart the address so the TLB will hit. Oh, okay, okay. Because I thought it would miss the TLB again, uh, and then go to page table. You, you, you go all the way back to TLB. So the moment you restart the instruction, you will hit. You do. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so why do we need to split memory into pages? Okay, so again, this is the idea. The idea is coming back to the concept of locality. All right, so even though you may write a lot of code, a lot of, you have a lot of data, the concept is you only need to access it, uh, a portion of it at a time. So we only want to keep a portion of it within that DRAM. Okay, if I don't split up, then I will need to allocate all my DRAM to fulfill whatever that the process requires. Whereas in this case, I can just set aside what is needed for that particular point of time that my process needs. Okay, if not, what will happen is you need to have a lot of DRAM to have multiple processes running at the same time. Okay, just like right now, okay, your, your, your laptop that you're running, okay, if you open up your task manager, you'll see so many processes running. Correct. And why is that possible? Because of this paging. That means all these processes are occupying pockets of memory in your DRAM. But actually, those processes require a lot more memory. Okay, but I only need a certain amount of memory for each point of time. That's why I can share. Correct. If I don't do this, then what happens is you can only open up a very limited number of processes. And then that's it, you run out of memory already. Okay, so um, yeah, so later I will send an announcement. Okay, on uh, some of the, uh, the the claims. Okay, how to submit your claims, um, as well as uh, yeah, some other project admin stuff. Okay, uh, and like I said before, your uh, uh, your your leaderboard or whatever does not determine your final grade okay so whatever it is you still need to make sure that uh, you still give your best okay for the exam okay so that uh, even if you have done very well so far you still want to maintain that okay if you have not done so well yet you want to try and push yourself up as much as possible okay so exam still plays a part okay so do not be complacent that okay i did very well for the project my midterm is very good so i can i can step back and relax okay so within the project itself, uh, within the project team itself, okay, 
again, each of you may get different uh, grades in the end. Okay, it all comes down to the exam. Okay, which is the one thing that's remaining. Okay, so you may have done very well for your, for your leaderboard. Okay, but one person may get a one grade, another person may get a totally different grade. Okay, uh, all these are things that happen all the time. Okay, so it all comes down to maintaining the momentum. Okay, until the exam is over. Okay, so that's all I have. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll still stay on the call if you have any questions or anything that you want to clarify. Okay, so thank you. Bye.